Hello, welcome to our last reading from 1 Samuel 17. This is the reading where it is focused on the battle, the battle between God and the gods of the Philistines, between David and Goliath. Now, over the recent course of human history, this story has been used to flesh out a lot of application, I think, which is erroneous, or at least erroneous in its application to me. For example, a lot of people have heard sermons probably end with something like, never underestimate your opponent. Something like, God can do anything. God does the miraculous. Or something like, slay your own Goliaths. The Goliaths of your life, cut them down. Never go into battle without God as your victor. You be the victor of the story of God. All of those applications are actually erroneous, not right, in terms of applying them directly to me. Like we said with the Psalms, there is a very important part missing when I apply this story to my life, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the application of all of these aspects of messianic prophecy. He is the one who slays the Goliath, and the Goliath of our life therefore is sin. Jesus is the one who can do anything, and he may bring me into his scope of works if you like and that anything he's going to do is preaching the gospel and how i can help him in that task rather than for me be the david of the task jesus is jesus can do anything jesus slays goliath the chief of which is my sin jesus does not underestimate any opponent because he has removed the opponents between him and us the key opponent of our life would be the spiritual battle we might have against Satan. And I might say, I can't underestimate those spiritual powers. But Jesus has no such concerns. He is the victor. He slays them. And so as you hear the reading again from 48 through to 58, just remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of these actual passages. And therefore, our task is to ask, now that Jesus fulfills them, how does Jesus help us be part of his work? That's the key bit. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, without a sword in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from his sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Eklon. Their dead were strewn along the Shararaim road to Gath. And Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Took the, David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. As Saul watched, and David going out to meet the Philistines, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, As surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, Find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. As you've heard that story, there are probably a few ideas that have come to you for the first time. For example, the story just seems to drag on for a few verses and you go, why is that? And just to broach that rather quickly, most commentators you read, for example, John Woodhouse commentary on 1 Samuel, uh, say that the narrative at the end of the story is there for a thematic purpose rather than a chronological one, much like actually the end of chapter 16 in regards to David being brought before the, the court of Saul. And now we're not, I think, supposed to think that David had these long-winded introductions with Saul over a small period of time and Saul somehow had forgotten them. 
I think what is happening here, as John Woodhouse would say, is that Saul's narrative here is being exposed to demonstrate his ignorance and his inability to be the leader of Israel. Previously, it highlighted his sort of mental state before coming into the battle. Now, we don't know whether that particular story chronologically happened before or after uh, David himself was in battle, but it seems like here that he's being introduced for the very first time. And the reasoning seems to be here, I think, to highlight that Saul let David go into battle, knowing very little about this man, young boy at all. And seemingly now it highlights that David is starting to go a different course than Saul. Saul's course, sadly, is as a king in decline, and David's course will be as a prince in waiting to be king. The battle itself, you have right there in front of you in verse 48. Now, what it does highlight is David's trust. The previous mention to the sword highlights the fact that David knew that he would kill the Philistine by the sword. One of those trick questions you can ask someone, how did David kill Goliath? And those people would ask, by the rock. But it seems like the text is saying that the rock knocked him out and David then killed him by cutting his head off. It highlights a few other things. The Philistines had no plan to be defeated. They ran away. They weren't going to uphold their end of the bargain because they never thought they would lose. <laughs> it's easy to be a bad sport, isn't it, when the consequences are so high or you never thought you were going to lose in the first place. But what it does show is that nobody, whether they were the Philistines, whether they were Goliath, whether they were Saul, whether they were Eliab, saw things from the perspective of God. Only David did. He knew that even though he didn't have a sword, he was going to get that sword and cut off that man's head because he knew that God had a plan and God's plan was to enable him to win and for God to be glorified. So David knew the plan of God at least was going to be leading to God's glorification. And that had to mean Goliath and the Philistines were going to be defeated. They pursued them. They drove them from the territory. And so we end our story with Israel being at peace once again, but completely had nothing to do with Saul. In fact, it highlights right near the end here with Saul and Abner that they've got no idea uh, how it happened, no idea why it happened, no idea who even brought it to pass. And yet these guys are the spiritual leaders of Israel. It shows that Israel has got a complete lack of leadership and that the leadership is passing from them to this man that God has anointed. And now we've seen evidence that this anointing is going to actually work. And King David will be a man who leads God's people. So what can we take from this? Most importantly, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of King David. The Messiah that is the king in waiting, sadly we'll see in not too long a period of time, David had lots of problems, lots of sin, but Jesus Christ had none of those problems. Jesus defeats the main Goliath of everybody's life, and that is sin that causes us to be in judgment of God. Jesus defeats that upon the cross. Jesus is the one who has the ultimate victory at Jerusalem. And that's the mention here of Jerusalem, which occurs many years later in the actual text itself. And it reflects a key phrase that we've heard in this story, which is only mentioned two other times in the scriptures, once in a psalm and then once in in reference to the Lord Jesus, that David says he comes in the name of the, of the Lord. The next time that is really mentioned in the New Testament is on the lips of those who are talking about the Lord Jesus. He comes in the name of the Lord. And the victory he has is the victory over the eternal enemy, Satan, and over the eternal problem that I have, sin and judgment. Jesus is the ultimate victor. So our victories are through him. Our victories are to point towards him. For he is the king, he is the Messiah, and he is the one we must follow. Amen.